Hello, bookworms. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we talk about your favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and I am so excited for you to meet today's guest, Swetha Nisthala of the lovely Instagram account called Book Squeaks. Swetha talked to me from her home in Hyderabad, India, in the middle of her night, which honestly tells you everything you need to know about how generous she is with her time and her fascinating conversation. She calls herself an internet extrovert and a real-life introvert, and she has one of the most interesting professional histories I've ever heard of. We started off discussing that and then veered into the crisis points of our lives that led us into big changes. And it all came back around to the book she chose to tell me about today. Swetha is a true fangirl for today's book and author, and I can't wait for you to hear her tell me why Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert is the best book ever. For more information on how to support this podcast, check out my Patreon. For about the cost of a latte, you can have access to all sorts of extra goodies. Every week, you'll get exclusive interview clips with my guests that are only available to patrons. I also send out advance notice of the books we discuss, curated reading lists, my monthly reading wrap-ups, including The Good, The Bad, and The DNFs, and essays about the reading life. Go to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash best book ever to learn more about how you can help me keep the candles burning over here in my reading cave. Now back to the show. Hi, Swetha. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi, Julie. I'm super glad to be here. This is something off my bucket list. Like being on a podcast is... Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I'm going to check it off and I'm going to be <laughs> happy forever. So thank <laughs> you for the opportunity. I have never been the, the conduit for someone's bucket list before. So that's exciting for me too. <laughs> Yay. That's great. Swetha, you know what I want to start with is um, your bio is so fascinating to me because it is so varied. It was really fun to read about all the things that you've done. And I've I've never met anybody with such an interesting resume in that, you know, a lot of people have a whole bunch of jobs in the biology field or a whole bunch of jobs that have something to do with math or finance. But you've really moved between disciplines. Can you tell me about that? You know how Indians are. Um, they always want to go the practical route. So sciences okay. are always the preferred option in India, like for parents. Usually people go for engineering, but I didn't really, I was not interested in engineering because it had a lot of math and physics. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, I can do chemistry. Even though I didn't really have a passion for it, it was just something for me to you know, get a job. Um, and then it was also, um, you know, a way for me to get go to the US, because getting a PhD, uh, you know, getting into a PhD program in the US for sciences is much easier than, you know, going there for humanities, like, I don't know, oh, English okay. literature, etc. So I wanted to go to the US. I went to Michigan State, um, I think it was in 2015, I moved to the US. Um, and I started my PhD program. But then after two years, I didn't really enjoy, you know, being in the lab for 15, 16 hours a day. So I quit because I was like, if I have to do five more years of this to gain a PhD, yeah. I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could do it. So I left that and then I got a job in New Jersey So I was doing that. Um, and then something like earth shattering happened to me, like personally, like my father passed away very That's suddenly. Scary. Yeah. And they, they were in India, of course, like my mother mm. and father. So like one, one night I just get a phone call, be like, you know, dad passed away it was like like he was 57 he was healthy oh and all God. so and then I'm an only daughter like an only child and an only daughter so I mean I came to India I you know spent like three a weeks here and then did all so 
I'm a Hindu, so we have a lot of um, rituals after somebody dies. So mm -hmm. to do all that, I was here for three weeks, and I thought, okay, you know, I'll just go back to the U.S. Everything's going to be just the same. That that was my um, that was what I thought. I didn't really account for how my mom was feeling. I was like, okay, fine. Like, you know, I have a life to live. You know, I'm just going to go back and live my life. But it didn't turn out that way. Um, so I had to make a choice. I was like, uh, I just want to be there for my mother. So I came back to India. And then even the job, over, even being a scientist was not all that it's cracked up to be. It's not like the TV shows. It's not like the movies that you, you know, um, basically I feel as if you were doing manual labor for 12, 12 hours a day and it just doesn't stop. I have never heard it described like that before. You're standing, you're standing on your feet all the day because, you know, the instruments are on benches and, uh -huh. You know, especially if you're in a chemistry lab, you physically have to lift very heavy weights. So I came back to India and I was like, maybe I can do something people oriented because I like talking to people. So my mind first went into HR. So I thought, okay, I know the pharmaceutical industry. I worked in it. So I randomly got an internship in that. And then COVID hit, you know, and my internship was redundant. Um, so then... I joined Bookstagram. I'm actually one of those Bookstagram success stories that Bookstagram helped me get a job in the marketing industry. No kidding. Yeah. I have no uh, traditional education in communications. I was from a science background completely. I just, for the pure passion of books, I started, I restarted my Bookstagram. And like all my um, future plans have gone to hell because of COVID. This is the second year running um, in this lockdown. We are still in lockdown here. Mm -hmm. So I'm just taking every day as it comes at this point. Those big life moments, you know, you said your father dying they, and, and COVID did this for all of us as well. Yep. They, they sort of crystallize things, don't they? And it's always yep. interesting to me that it takes a very bad event to make us stop and rethink. Yep. That is exactly what happened to me. Like after my father died, I really had to reevaluate things. And I was like, um, I felt the immediacy of, you know, we have a finite life. Mm. What am I doing? Why am I going through life, you know, almost like sleepwalking through it? At what point in this trajectory did you come across this book that we're talking about today, Eat, Pray, Love? Had you already read it when your father died? Yes, I did. I don't know when I bought it, the first copy, um, but it had the movie cover and the movie came out in 2010. So somewhere right after, like somewhere around 2010, 2011, I think I bought the book and read it. At in India, time, at, at that point? In India, yeah, okay. in India. And at that point, I, I was this, you know, young person who badly wanted to go to the U.S., you know, um, and, and just, you know, live by herself. I mean, I haven't really traveled out of the country that much at that point. Like I've been to a few places inside my country with my mm -hmm. peers. Um, but yeah, since I was five years old, I can clearly remember. I The first um, place that I wanted to visit was the United Kingdom, but I haven't gone to the UK yet. You give somebody like me at the age of 20, when I was raring to go traveling, a book like Eat, Pray, Love, where Elizabeth Gilt, it's her real life. She got to travel to Italy, India, and Indonesia in one year. Um, so, you know, she was as, like at rock bottom when she went to travel. I was also, I don't know, depressed, anxious, like growing up in my teenage. And um, I really connected to this. It's weird. She was 30-something, you know, woman who wrote this book. I was so young. I was 20-something. And 
I somehow connected to her, you know, life trajectory without going through some of the things, obviously, that she went through. I wasn't married. I'm still not. Um, I was, and at that point, I, I didn't even, I wasn't in any relationship, like, ever. But the idea of finding yourself, because I'm also a self-help junkie sort of person, self-help. I, I used to read a lot of, uh, you know, those books, Chicken Soup. Was that Chicken Soup for the Soul? Uh-huh. Yeah, growing up, I used to read those. I had all kinds of self-help books growing up because I was, I, I was trying to fix myself, like constantly improve myself. It, I, I, I mean, just to be liked, I think, uh, growing up because I was a little bit different, you know, very bookish in, in a class of people who didn't really, you know, who, who were all into playing, you know, running around and playing. And I want to read books. I know that feeling. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I was just trying to fix myself. Did you know I actually um, read, uh, do you know that book, Dale Carnegie? Uh, what, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I actually read that book um, and tried to follow those rules to make friends. And I still use, yeah, I still use some of the teachings that I've learned from the book even now. So I was that person and then this came and I was like, and the fact that Elizabeth Gilbert came to India to play a role, because I was more familiar with, you know, the, it's my country and, mm -hmm. you know, I was Hindu and I, I know how ashrams, you know, are and, and I've been through that experience. Um, growing up so it, it felt a little familiar but then again oh it it felt unattainable like uh, because to be honest as an Indian woman you have a structure you know growing up like you're supposed to study you know and then get married and then you know have children and then just you know have grandchildren and something as crazy as solo traveling in the world is it, it still feels unattainable to me <laughs> at this point of 28 years old um, and I've actually gone and lived in the US for a while I mean one one of the things is obviously I'm I'm a very I'm a scaredy cat I I, <laughs> I don't want to go alone anywhere even like to the end of my street I don't I it's just my personality and on top of it, you have, you know, these things that you grew up with. Um, so, yeah, like just blew my mind, this book, when I read it. And then I connected it to, to it in so many levels. But the primary thing was the travel. And the other thing that stayed with me was how Elizabeth Gilbert went through um, her depression. Like she like battled it and like, she defined God, you know, not the conventional God that we speak of. I really connected to that because I'm spiritual too. And I, I'm religious, but I still sort of question it a little bit. The first time when I read it, I knew that it's a very important book for me personally. Um, when I was moving to the U.S., I, I have a huge book collection. I mean, I'm a bookworm. I couldn't take all my books with me. So I took about um, six or seven books with me. And oh, my loved. God. <laughs> yeah. That's not a lot of books. <laughs> it is not. But I, I mean, I can't do anything. Right? No, of course like, not. That sounds like an <laughs> agonizing decision to have to make. I also took uh, two books by Cecilia Ahern. I don't know how to pronounce her name. Uh -huh. I, I, love, I love her. I also took this other book called Americana. Uh, written by Chimamanda Gozi Adichie. And then what happened is, when I was coming back, I went to Kentucky to meet a friend. And Nashville was like four hour, a four-hour drive from her place. Um, so we went to Nashville. I went to Parnas's book. I got his t-shirt. I wore it. Yep. Oh, nice. It's like, I, it's like a mecca for book lovers. And oh, I, Totally. Before I leave the U.S., I wanted to go to Parnas's bookstore. <laughs> like, like I need my photo op. I need yes. to 
So I stood outside the bookstore, took a photo. I went in, took photos. Like I was just hanging out at the bookstore for so long. I didn't want to leave it. And that <laughs> is when I saw this beautiful 10th anniversary edition signed by Elizabeth Gilbert. I knew oh my gosh. I freaked out. I was like, <laughs> this, this is a sign. So I bought this book and I left my old copy in the U.S. I donated it to the local library. Nice. The amount of love that I carry for her, um, I don't know. Like, what is it about her? I just want to hug this book. I just want to, like, want this book and, like, everything that she ever says to, like, get into a molecular level, like, in my body. I just, I just am so passionate about her. And <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> I don't think it's weird at all. You know what I was thinking as I was rereading it for this conversation? I've read this book several times, and I also adore it. I always forget how funny she is. I know. I was laughing, and then I was mostly, I was just internally screaming during this <laughs> read because I'm connecting to it more than I connected to it, um, I don't know, eight years earlier when mm -hmm. I read it before. Um it's it's also because of my personal experiences as well that I can connect to it more now. Even though I didn't go to Italy, I did go to San Francisco and the kind of liberation that she felt in Italy, I was standing on Golden Gate Bridge and like I will never forget that moment like forever. Really? Yeah, I have I had my little mini eat pray love before I came back to India from the US. And what were the places? San Francisco, Nashville, and then Chicago. Why Chicago? It's my second favorite city in the U.S., but it's something about Chicago. And New York City felt very, very big to me, the kind of big that I can't comprehend. And it was just, like, too busy. And somehow Chicago was the right size of big. And then you went to San Francisco. Oh my God, San Francisco blew my mind. Like, it's, it's my favorite city in the U.S. now. Um, it's mine it's too. <laughs> virtual hi-fi. Virtual hi-fi. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's talk about that, um, about this reread. And I hope it's okay that I share this story. But um, you messaged me before we started talking and said you were having a really hard time getting through this book this time mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you had to keep stopping. Yep. Why do you think you're stopping so much this time around? What What is it that you have to think so much about? I'm I'm just writing notes and all sorts of things um, for a future me. You know, when I can just open the book and like just go to the relevant passage. Uh, for example, like mm. th this particular edition has a preface written by her. Like she read the book after ten years, and then she wrote, you know what you know, she looked back on, you know, what she left out of the book and, you know, what she oh, should have said, interesting. especially on her like child, you know, on choosing not to have children and how in the original book, she was a little bit ambiguous, but then in her preface, when she looked back at it, she knew the exact moment, I think in Italy, that when she knew that she was never, she didn't, she never wanted to have children. She had this encounter with a lady and her son, and he was just playing. And then um, Liz was sitting opposite her in the train. And just to give the, uh, the mother, you know, some me time because she was reading a book or something, she started playing with a kid. And then when the mother took her kid and she walked away at the station, that's when she was like, she said it was like a physical symbol when she walked the other way and then the mother and the kid walked the other way. She knew at that moment, oh man, like those observations and, you know, everything that she talks about on her, on how she felt old. She was 34, year, 34 years old um, when she went on this trip. And then when she, when she went to Italy, she was feeling very old and she was not. That's what she mm -hmm. said in her preface. She was like, I'm 10 years older now, and it, I have never felt younger than now. That, that's what she has written here. So just a lot of little tidbits that I was just, like, internally screaming about. I was like, oh, my God, like, you know, what women 
this particular thing of what society teaches women to be. Mm-hmm. I am very passionate about that subject because I am living in that society and like it's always a set path, you know, you're supposed to have everything, you know, stable, settled, you know, go in a straight line. Um, to be honest, in India, uh, women are, I mean, most women don't date. It's not encouraged. People get married, like arranged marriages, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I would love to live in a world where there are not those many rules of who a woman should be, how mm-hmm. she should behave, what she should wear, what clothes she, you know, need to wear, and at what time can she step out of the house and in what time she needs to remain in the house. This is not radical feminism. This is just basic human things. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, the culture is different, obviously. I can't really say, oh, my God, like Indian culture is bad or the American culture is great. They're just different. Because sure, even sure. Elizabeth Gilbert, when she was writing about it, she said even in American society, like, you know, woman needs to, you know, have a job, have children. Like, you know, there's an age for everything. And, you know, get your shit yeah. together. And then, yeah. you know, just, you know, push all your feelings down and just, live for other people sort of thing. I think that's there for women everywhere. Yes. And what Liz did by just throwing the conventions and she was like, I'm going to choose myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was shocking for women everywhere in the world. And I think that is why this book resonated so much because why <laughs> why were we tied down before and why should we break free and you know and why should it be a shock to everyone do you think that's what appeals to so many women about this is that she is completely unapologetic because we're so trained to apologize for the things that we don't do and the reason so many people can't stand her by the way is that she absolutely refuses to apologize that's my thing that's my thought Yep, exactly. And she she wrote in her preface that she got a lot of hate mail after April mm. left. Like literally, you know, some women, like she wrote like, um, listen, bitch, don't you think I hate my marriage too, bitch? Like literally she was putting like bitch at the end of every sentence. Oh my God. She, wrote, she wrote a hate letter to Liz Gilbert. Don't you think I would love to get a divorce and go find myself in the world, bitch? Like, I stick with it because this is what marriage means. It means honoring a commitment. Oh, man, that's yeah, a like, sad woman. I mean, silently judging is one thing. Actually writing to <laughs> is a whole another. I mean, I, I judge too. I sure. silently judge and go about my day. I yeah. do not take out the time to write a letter to <laughs> a person that I hate and then send it to them. Right, yeah. right. That's that's a whole new level of pissed off. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. Oh, oh, my gosh. Yeah. And then one more thing that I resonate on a serious note was how, you know, that whole depression and, you know, that night um, that she goes back to where she was on her bathroom floor and she was mm-hmm. just like, please, please, please tell me what to do. I have been there mm-hmm. many times in my life. Uh, I mean, before I read Eat, Pray, Love, after I read Eat, Pray, Love. But every time I end up on the floor like that, when, you know, some major thing is happening with me, my mind goes back to Eat, Pray, Love. There's a reason that this book, like, really stuck with me. When I'm down there, I literally do what Liz did in the book. It fe- feels very profound to me. Like, I'm, like, I'm crying about my own issues, and I'm suddenly, like, Eat, Pray, Love pops into my head, and then I'm, like, Oh, look, I'm right here, like where Liz was. The book has become a conversation. Yep, yep. And that is why I'm going through it very, very slowly because, again, the same anxiety that I keep talking about, when would I again reread this book? Would it take another (laughs) 10 years for me to reread it? I better reread it properly this time and (laughs) attach as many post-its as I can underline many passages as I can and then 
Oh my god, I, I just sound like a span girl. Um, you know, like how people are crazy about movie stars. That's how I'm crazy about this woman <laughs> who I've never met, who just wrote a book. Um, but somehow no, I understand completely impacted my life so much that in my lows and my highs, I remember her. And it's very, it's not even voluntary. It, it's very subconscious. And even right now, after so many years, like, you know, like publicly, um, how her second marriage, like, mm -hmm. you know, was over. And then she, her best friend, Raya, um, she, she was in a relationship with her. And I was like, I just love everything that Elizabeth oh, Gilbert does. Like, even that, the, the grace and dignity with which she handles that and, you know, um, how she was with Raya and then after Raya's death, um, how Elizabeth dealt with the grief. I turned to her. I turned to her um, Instagram posts on grief, on her articles that talks about grief when my own father died. I turned to her at her writing and just whatever she has to say at every stage of my life ever since I've discovered her. Yeah, she's like my soul writer. I use this word soul writer because because sometimes like I don't even I have so many complicated feelings mm -hmm. and I can't even articulate what I'm feeling. And then even like when I was reading Eat, Pray, Love, like there were some passages where like that, like that is how I feel. Mm -hmm. And she has written it down. Now I know how to talk about it. And I think that's the greatest thing ever. Um, Swetha, what are you reading right now? I just finished House in the Cerulean Sea. Oh my God, I loved it. It is so adorable. And I stayed up late till 2 a.m. last night <gasps> reading that book, like finishing that. And at the end of it, I just hugged it tight. Oh. And I just <laughs> sat there and I just contemplated everything I've just read. And I know that I want to read that book to my future children because the, uh -huh. the message that uh, Sir Yolindsay has is so important. Before we end this, I really want to talk. I, I feel like it would be just glaringly um, ignorant of me to not bring up the COVID crisis in India. We've touched on it a couple of times. But at this time in our history, it is particularly ravaging India. For my listeners who are inclined to help, um, can you recommend aid centers or ways that we can be of service? So, yes, it, it, it is very, it was very, very bad back in um, March and April. The government is trying. All I know, the situation is dire. And when you open your social media, like there are like SOS calls, like in every story, like people are just sharing phone numbers and like requests for uh, ventilators, oxygen supplies, hospital beds, ambulances, like, you know, all sorts of things. And then the people were isolating at home, you know, where everyone at home got COVID, they mm -hmm. needed like somebody to cook for them and, you know, send home deliveries and uh, there was this very real survivor's guilt sort of thing that that was happening to people who were not directly affected like it's you know we we are grateful for it but then again like it's it's so like you look at what's happening to other people and then you just question everything yeah so a lot of uh, books to grammars in India, they really try to do their best. There, there was this one particular um, uh, giveaway fundraiser held by two books to grammars. Um, they actually collaborated with publishers. They collaborated with five or six publishing houses in India who donated books for the giveaway fundraiser. There was a lot of good happening as well. There, were, there was a lot of people helping each other happening as well. So obviously I could give you a list of places. These are all doing great work. So I thought it has been marvelous talking to you. I want you to know you have an open invitation. Anytime you have a book you want to talk about, I would love to have you back on to talk to me about what I should be reading next. Um, will you tell my listeners where they can find you and the work that you do? Okay. So I'm books 
tweaks on Bookstagram. It's the cutest and, name, by the way. I, I didn't even get to ask you that. Why do you have that that name? I squeal a lot. Like you, you keep hearing, I internally scream about things, and I externally also scream about things. So book screams doesn't really have the you know. <laughs> so it just became book squeaks. Yes, that's very good. Yeah, book screams would be a little intimidating, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for joining me today. It has been an absolute delight talking to you. Thank you so, so much for having me, Julie. I absolutely enjoyed this conversation. And obviously, if you would have, like, I would have just kept on talking about this book, Deep Cray Lap. At the end of this talk, I really want all the listeners to just buy this brilliant, brilliant book. If you haven't read it yet, read Eat, Pray, Love. Uh, I mean, if you're a woman, read it. Like, it's like essential reading for you. Thanks for listening, bookworms. For more information on this episode and links to all the books we discussed, go to our website, bestbookeverpodcast.com. You can also follow the podcast on Instagram at bestbookeverpodcast. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and you can find me everywhere as Julie wrote a book. If you loved this episode as much as I loved making it, why not leave a review wherever you're listening? Each review helps new listeners find my work, and I'm so grateful for your help. Thanks for joining me today, and I will see you at the library.